being recorded. So this is the start of Quasi's Spring 2013 Cyber Seminar Series. The theme, the thing as you, the theme for the spring, as you can see, is complementary methods and models. And let me just first begin by introducing myself. My name is Kayla Berry, and I am Quasi's Communications and Outreach Specialist. Um, and you probably received quite a few emails from me, so I want to thank you for joining us today and supporting this program. I'd also like to, one way I like to begin our cyber seminars is asking people to in, type into the chat box sort of uh, where they're tuning, calling in from or tuning in from, and that just gives us an idea of where everyone's at and your background, so I'd appreciate if we get some discussion going on in the chat box. So we have a noise on. Okay. Uh, let me continue next by introducing our, I'd also like to introduce and thank our host, Adam Ward from the University of Iowa. He's now been our host for two series, last fall and also this spring. He's done a great job, and thank you, Adam, for setting up our great speaker schedule for this spring and for all your effort. Um, really appreciated, so thank you. I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce our speaker for today, Jessica. Sure. Well, thanks a lot, Kayla, and uh, and everyone out there, just so, just so we're all clear, uh, Kayla is the one who does all the hard work of the organization, working with our speakers to get the schedule finalized, get everything to work with uh, the Adobe Connect software. Um, so she really is the one who does the hard work. Um, I have the pleasure today of introducing Jessica Lundquist. Um, Jessica's uh, bachelor's degree is in atmospheric science from the University of California, Davis. Uh, master's of Science and PhD degrees, uh, both in Oceanography from the University of California, San Diego. Um, after graduation, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the NOAA Climate Diagnostic Center uh, in Boulder. And since uh, 2006, she's been an assistant professor in the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Washington. Um, let's see, Jessica's resume is, uh, is quite long as I was preparing this introduction, um, but She's got more than 30 peer-reviewed publications, um, mostly centering on the topics of mountain hydrology and snowmelt dynamics as a driver uh, of some of the hydrological variability that we see in high mountain meadows in particular. Uh, and so with that, um, Jessica, I'll turn things over to you, and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Adam. All right, so um, today I'm going to be talking about mountain hydrology as revealed by networks of inexpensive sensors with going along the topic of fusing um, measurements and modeling. And what you see on my title slide here is really what looks like a pile of junk. And honestly, after we leave our inexpensive sensors out in the mountains for a while, that is what they look like. Um, but they still work remarkably well. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about, in the upper left-hand corner, you see a pressure sensor that you can use for stream stage measurements. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see a, um, a precip gauge that uh, is a victim of the snowpack. In the lower left, you see um, a funnel holding a temperature sensor. In the lower right, you see a whole bunch of temperature sensors that were buried in the ground after they've been brought back in the office. So um, I grew up in California and have always loved flying over the Sierra Nevada. And when I started doing my graduate studies, I was super excited looking out the window seeing Yosemite National Park and I said to the woman next to me, look, snow, I study that. And she looked at me and she said, really? Why would anyone care about that? It was very, very uh, disheartening to me as a new grad student. Um, but of course I had the right answer. Um, but, you know, especially in California, over 50% of our water supply for the western U.S. comes from mountain snow. And, um, you know, I asked her, what do you drink? And um, she became convinced, or at least went back to reading her book and left me alone. Um, so when people started moving out to the western United States, um, John Wesley Powell wrote in 1888 that water will limit development in the West. And we know where everyone lives now that it wasn't so true. Basically, we built a huge system of reservoirs to capture that mountain snow. And here you see on the, um, on the left, I, I keep losing my 
my arrow, I'm not sure. Oh, here it is, little green arrow. Um, on the left, you see um, the state of California's water project. The light blue lines are the two major river systems, and the dark blue line is the aqueduct system, um, taking all that water down to uh, Southern California, where that woman on the plain um, lived. All right. Um, and you know the reason we need all the water is here you see a graphic of total water withdrawals in the United States um, and California and Eastern Washington and Southern Idaho are all highlighted as places with huge water withdrawals. Basically, um, the this sign I took this picture while driving down Highway 99 in the Central Valley of California. Food grows where water flows. Um, this is why we care so much about our snowpack. Um, additionally, the western United States has a Mediterranean climate. Um, here I'm showing you stream flow from two rivers in California, the Smith River up on the north coast and the Merced River, which drains Yosemite, where I showed you the picture of snow before. Also has lots of nice waterfalls. Um, and you can see that the rain-dominated Smith River really flows off as soon as it rains. Um, that stops for the whole summer in the Sierra Nevada. And the snowmelt provides water at a time when it really is most useful for agriculture. Um, the sad truth is that conditions good for snow are bad for observations. Um, and so here is a picture of um, one of the stations put out by the NOAA Hydrometeorological Test Bed in California in 2011, which some of you may recall was a record snow year. Um, the snow has used to be up over the top. It uh, damaged the solar panel, the snow depth sensor, and the precip gauge here. And what you see in the graph on the left is number of stations um, on the y-axis versus elevation on the x-axis. And you know, due to the harsh weather, power limitations, and difficult access, you know, our number of measurements drop off dramatically as we go up in the hills. Um, so we know when we start thinking about mountains, we don't have a lot of measurements up there, but we know that mountains in general are colder and wetter than where we live. So in most of our hydrologic modeling, we approximate a linear change. Um, we generally, here's my little graphic of mountains, and we generally approximate that precipitation increases with elevation, and that the rate of increase is generally a linear fit to station data from anything you can find up high in the mountains and temperature decreases um, with elevation. We um, commonly approximate the sort of standard atmosphere lapse rate, which is an average decrease of 6.5 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, I've also highlighted here the zero degree Celsius line and where that intersects the mountain, because that becomes critically important in where snow falling from the sky starts changing to rain. So one of the common used ways to you know, get out these average ways of changing temperature and precipitation with elevation is PRISM, which is the parameter regression on independent slopes model developed by Chris Daly at Oregon State University. And um, I, I want to highlight this because it's actually one of the things I've found incredibly useful for any kind of model in the mountains, and it's kind of the baseline that I always try to beat. Um, it's based on you know, an elevation influence on climate, um, terrain-induced climate transitions, basically the west slope of the mountains would be mapped differently from the east slope of the mountains. And it's also based on persistence of climatic patterns, um, basically uses a climate map assuming that patterns are the same through time. Um, here we have a, um, just an illustration of how PRISM, this is a graphic again from Chris Daly, how PRISM calculates the 1961 to 1990 mean January precip in the Sierra Nevada. And you can see that basically down here in the lower right, every um, map of where precipitation is on the west slope is plotted versus its elevation. And a linear fit along that topographic facet is fit to predict at each location. Um, you can download either the 800-meter climate average product or the four-kilometer monthly product, and I would recommend the 800-meter product for reasons you can ask me later if you are interested. So when we start going about this, um, when, when do these methods and averages work and when not? So let's start with when they work. Um, really, for the western United States, using PRISM works remarkably well in the mean. Um, what I'm showing you here is um, on the right, you see temperature versus elevation. 
Um, these are the mean temperatures over three years in the Sierra Nevada near Yosemite National Park. Um, the different symbols show a number of different sensor types, which for this case don't matter so much. But what you see is this black line, which is that standard atmosphere lapse rate of six and a half degrees Celsius per kilometer. On the mean, works great. Um, I'm citing here two papers for more details on this. If you go to wetter climates, you'll find that actually the mean decrease is less. Um, up in Washington, it's closer to five degrees Celsius per kilometer. In Colorado, at times, it's very close to a dry out about of over nine degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, but PRISM captures that and will give you an excellent understanding of the mean. Um, let's move on to precipitation. Um, and here is the northern Sierra Nevada, California, um, sort of orient you. I'm pointing the green arrow near where Lake Tahoe is. San Francisco would be off to your left here. Um, and again, this is an average over seven years um, in place with a very dense network of precipitation gauges. Um, on the left, you see PRISM. There's both a spatial map showing in color the mean annual precipitation and a, basically a box plot diagram of precipitation versus elevation, um, both for PRISM and for every observation station. And again, you can see in the mean, this I would consider a very good fit. So, okay, if everything worked, I wouldn't have a job, right? So when do these not work? Um, it turns out that while everything is pretty good in the mean, they're almost always wrong in the specifics. So as soon as you want to know something about a specific location, a specific storm, late season stream flow, um, we start having problems. This is important for ecology, maybe spatial management planning, thinking about climate refugia, where does cold air pool. It's important when thinking about a flood event when we have rain on snow. And it turns out it's also important in terms of when and where does snow disappear, which um, plays, turns out that heterogeneity and variability from the mean is very important for late season flow. So what I'm going to do today is walk you through these. So um, given that we are wrong in the specifics, what can we do about it? Um, that's when we start getting into, oh boy, we can use these cheap sensors everywhere because we need measurements in a lot of places. So I'll start with talking a little bit about temperature studies and how they can be used in ecology. Um, here um, is a graphic showing um, a number of different temperature sensors that I have used. Um, up here you see an I button. This is an onset tidbit and an onset pendant. Um, and then these down here both now measure temperature and relative humidity. Um, all of these are self-recording loggers that are fairly cheap, fairly robust, and I found that of everything I've tried, temperature is probably the easiest environmental measurement to take. Um, so the keys are, you know, any one of you in the audience could go start doing this today. You can measure temperature in your favorite place. Um, I commonly buy one of these i-buttons for about $30. Um, the real keys to keep in mind when you're using this is to think, number one, what what are you actually measuring? Is your instrument heating up from the sun? Is your instrument being insulated from the snow? Or are you measuring ambient air temperature? Um, are you measuring what you want to be measuring? Because you can put these in all kinds of configurations that you know, maybe you want to measure heating from the sun. Um, be creative. The, the great thing about being able to buy these for $30 each is um, you can add them into almost any budget you have and get enough that if you lose half of them, um, nobody will yell at you. Um, also, we've been utilizing a lot of spatiotemporal data processing techniques. As soon as you put out hundreds and hundreds of sensors, you not only need to be creative, you need to be skillful in how you process the data. It's actually easier to collect than to keep up with sometimes. All right, so you need a lot of sensors. They need to be cheap. I showed you that. They need to be easy to deploy, right? Um, if we are trying to get um, inexpensive measurements of ambient air temperature, we need some kind of radiation shield. Um, I initially said, oh, I can buy a temperature sensor for $30 and then a radiation shield for $350. I don't think so, right? So we said, okay, let's try trees. Trees look like great radiation shields, right? They evolved over time to intercept lots of radiation so they can grow. Um, so here's a study. This is in Tuolumne Meadows, which you will be seeing a lot in this talk. Here's a picture of the I button stuck in funnels, some, one hanging on a pole here, one stuck in a 
tree that was the sparse tree out in the middle of nowhere. You can sort of see it peeking through there. And one stuck back in the tree in a dense forest where you can't see it at all because it's completely covered um, with tree branches. And um, it turns out that um, here you see um, the one on the pole is in red, the one on the single tree is in blue, and the one in the dense group of trees is in black. And um, what I'm pointing is a difference from a sort of standard weather station with an official gill radiation shield. I'll note this is unaspirated, and some work has said that even those are somewhat biased in this terrain. But given that that's our industry standard, how well does this work? And what you can see that um, while the one you just stick on the pole is biased, particularly in terms of maximum temperature, during the time, these dashed lines here show you when there was snow cover at my site. And you can see, particularly when there's snow cover, I put a funnel on top. I didn't put anything underneath. You can see that reflected radiation from the snow cover is heating that sensor um, 15 to 20 degrees more than the properly shielded sensor. However, by the same token, the one that's in the dense shield of trees is, is very reliable. Um, and so as long as you have a good tree, you can get good measurements. Um, a lot of people have asked me, well, what if I want to measure on a glacier and I don't have trees? And I, I have not yet come up with a solution. Maybe some brilliant graduate student can devise the next best thing. So, okay, we've got trees. I live in the Pacific Northwest right now, and I have a lot of trees. But my trees are too tall. I grew up in California, and I could climb the trees, and I moved to Seattle and started hiking the Cascades. There's no way I know how to climb these trees. And now I also have grad students, so I don't want to send off on missions that might cause them to sue me later. So if the trees are too tall, um, we started launching the sensors into the trees. So this is um, this is me. Right here in my hands is a HyperDog tennis ball launcher. The main motivation for this is not because um, you absolutely need a HyperDog tennis ball launcher, but because I actually – um, was always the last person picked on the softball team. I don't have a very good arm, and I can't throw that high. Um, but with the HyperDog launcher, I can. Um, here we are in North Cascades National Park. This um, it was the tallest tree I could find on top of this mountain. And you can see I'm launching a tennis ball attached to a nylon cord. It goes over a branch of the tree. And um, we did this, started this in 2007 and 2008. We got 100% of the sensors back. They all worked. They were all successfully retrieved. And if you want to do this, if you have tall trees, um, this website here gives you step-by-step -step instructions. Um, they're currently used quite a bit by um, biology professor Yannick Horace Lambers is studying Mount Rainier ecosystems um, with these sensors and all of her trees. And one other thing, you may want to talk to someone who's good at climbing. We had to learn how to properly flake rope into a bag so that when you launch it up, it doesn't initially become completely tangled. Um, you need it to go smoothly in your launch up over the tree. So here's our temperature sensor. You create the pulley system, and you can pull it up and then pull it back down and get the temperature sensor off of it. Um, so this is probably what I'm most famous for, just because people like shooting temperature sensors into trees. Um, but the, the application of what we found once we started putting out lots and lots of these sensors is mainly that temperature inversions and cold air pools are very common in mountain valleys, um, more common than I ever would have thought. And it turns out that mountain valleys is really where most of our weather stations are located. So most of our existing stations that we were fitting lines to were in themselves biased. Um, this is a picture in Yosemite National Park. It's actually a cool still morning after a forest fire event. This is kind of this is smoke pooling down here in a cold air pool location. Um, this is a picture again. Here's Mount Rainier, where you saw some of those um, shots of shooting temperature sensors into trees. Um, if you have ever flown into this region of the world, you can see the top of the mountain is above the clouds. You go under the clouds, um, and the standard lapse rate right is very often wrong. Um, the graph on the left is from Yosemite National Park. Um, the blue sites are in a valley. They happen to be in Tuolumne Meadows, where I showed you um, those were where the trees were next to the standard Met station. Um, anytime large-scale winds are weak, there's high-pressure sunshine. Local topography controls mountain weathers, and you'll see you know very strong inversions. You can see that um, right here in Tuolumne, the in January, the temperature is less than negative 20 degrees Celsius, where quite a bit higher up the mountain, it's only negative 15 degrees Celsius. Um, this has large implications for 
snow dynamics and for ecosystems. Um, the, the basics are actually very strongly controlled by topography, which makes this actually not so hard to predict where it's likely to occur. It turns out the difficulty is predicting when it's likely to occur. Um, at night, long wave radiation cools the air adjacent to the surface. Cold air is denser than warm air, so it flows down, down the hill and down the valley. And cold air can collect in flat valley bottoms and local depressions. So one thing we did was saying, okay, we can take a digital elevation model and map where these depressions are. We can look, this is our, this is from Rocky Mountain National Park. You're detecting a theme. I really like to put sensors in national parks. Um, where we put a whole bunch of these um, small temperature sensors out. This is the digital elevation model right here in the upper left. On um, upper right, we mapped out the slope everywhere, likes places with flat slopes, likes places with a local depression and concave topography. Um, we checked this with the ability of the statistical mapping method with I buttons here and in three other locations. And it turns out that to a first order, this works very well. The algorithm is in the, this paper and is available on my website if you would like to use it. It's, it's in MATLAB, um, which I apologize is proprietary software, but you're welcome to recode it in anything you like. And um, there is a secondary method that I don't have time to go in now, which actually takes into account of whether the valley you're in is constricting. I'm trying to draw pictures with my hands, and I'm sorry you can't see me. Um, it's constricting or getting wider as you move down the valley, um, which, again, I don't have time for today, but feel free to ask questions. So we can map where these cold air pools are. We can use these very inexpensive sensors. And it turns out that this has actually had much more implications for the ecological community than it has for snow hydrology. It turns out that in terms of most basins, the one location where you put your weather sensor was probably that cold air pool. But as long as you don't base your overall lapse rate on that one location, you actually are OK as long as you get the right mean lapse rate. However, if you are a pika or a wolverine living up there, you, your world is much smaller than your typical basin. And what the temperature is is very important there. So Connie Millar has done some work um, looking at cold air pools and pikas. And Lori Flint is currently doing some work looking at wolverine habitat and cold air pools. That's very interesting. I'm uh, calling them my charismatic mini fauna. Um, Kate Wilkin at UC Berkeley has also done some preliminary analysis showing that fires burn much less frequently in cold air pools, which I find exciting. And I think her work is still underway. Um, we in my lab have been working on tools for analysis, which we are happy to share the things, the cat map I mentioned is, is available. Um, we've also been doing a lot with um, the technique of empirical orthogonal functions, which I, again, don't have time to go into in detail, but are a great way to really deal with large sets of spatiotemporal data. All right, so that's a little bit about the temperature. What can we do in terms of rain versus snow, rain on snow, and flood events? Um, for this, we obviously need more than just temperature. Temperature is important. We also really need an idea of precipitation, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can start using some inexpensive stream flow or stream stage gauges as well to understand these events. So um, what's the, um, the cheap equivalent of those temperature sensors to throw in a stream? Um, these, I've been using um, just pressure sensors that, again, are self-recording. Um, and when I started, um, this is a picture of me when I was a graduate student, and this is Brian Huggett, who worked with me closely at that time. We started developing ways to deploy these in mountain streams in Yosemite, which I'm now learning in the Pacific Northwest. I was remarkably lucky that there's not a lot of sediment moving in those streams because this is a concrete poured in a cake pan um, that was provided by my advisor, Dan Cahan, and we drilled holes, or I've got a cordless drill. We drilled holes in the top of the PVC pipe, and we stuck this level logger inside with a um, just a screwdriver holding it in. And then in cases where we were too far out in the mountains to take our concrete, we hiked out, and Brian here has a mesh bag with very heavy rocks we pulled out of the stream, put the PVC pipe in, tied it all up, and threw it in with a cable tied to a tree. Um, pressure sensors 
are very easy to deploy. You don't need to develop a rating curve, but you also need to be very careful in that they provide you with an index of the depth of water in the stream. So they give you information on timing and relative amounts of stream flow, but they do not give you volume. They cannot be used exactly in terms of what you know hydrologists really like to compare with their model of cubic meters per second. So um, there's also we, we developed ways of getting a little more sophisticated than our bags of rocks over the years of building our own what we call a wilderness stilling tube. Um, Brian is here fixing it to the bank of the Tuolumne River, and there are there's step-by-step -step instructions on how you can do this in the supplemental methods of a paper um, that I published in 2009. And the full references are at the very end of this presentation, which I'm told will be archived if, if you want to build one of these. Again, it's, it's pretty easy, and you can do this on a very low budget. Um, so how, how can you start using these techniques? Um, so here's an example. Um, we're going to Northern California now. Um, Sacramento is downstream. This is the North Fork of the American River Basin that you see the outline for here. Lake Tahoe is just over on your right. San Francisco would be if you went west till you hit the ocean. Um, and this is a basin. Um, you may have heard that Sacramento is the most at risk after New Orleans to a giant flood disaster. I grew up in Sacramento, and I look at the flood maps, and my best friend from high school and her two children are likely to be under 20 feet of water if the levees ever fail. So I care about this area. And um, what you can see here is that it spans a wide range of elevations from near sea level up to about 3,000 meters. And whether you get a flood from rain on snow depends first and foremost on the area over which it's raining. So um, here are my uh, cartoon raindrops and snowflakes. And this is just a case study where we say, okay, this transition between snow and rain is about 1,000 meters. And so over, uh, let me get uh, my little arrow. Here's my arrow. Um, over here on the right, you can see we have a standard USGS gauge at the bottom of the basin. And this heavy black line is area versus elevation for that gauge. And then we have these inexpensive pressure sensors in three basins. They up here at high elevation, we have the Onion Creek Basin in intermediate elevations, the East Fork Basin, and then down here is the Colfax Basin. So you can see with this case, we would expect that there would be stream, there would be water flowing in the Colfax Basin because this is, right here is Colfax, this is its area versus elevation, it's all below that. The main basin, we probably have about 40% contributing, and we wouldn't expect anything from our upper basins to be contributing. So if we look at the um, stream flow for the whole basin up here, here's two events with very low elevation rain versus snowstorms. And indeed, as I showed you, you can see that this blue line, the Colfax Creek, there is a response. Stream flow is rising at these, and the two upper basins are not doing anything. You can also see that in terms of rain, snow, flood, really nothing is happening in the whole basin. But this is when you don't need to worry. So let's go on to another case. Let's make it rain much higher in the basin. Um, now the red line here is dividing rain versus snow. Again, you can see this on the um, total basin area versus elevation map on the right-hand side. And now you can see that whereas before, less than 40% of the basin was contributing. Now over 80% is contributing. So by this, the same storm will have over doubled the amount of water contributing to um, runoff. So now we would expect in this case that with a 2,000 meter elevation, we would see runoff in both Colfax Creek and the East Fork Basin, as well as much more coming out. Um, and so here is a case study event. You can see this is actually um, the, this was a, it was not a damaging flood, but it was a flood that made all of the forecasters miss their Christmas and New Year holiday. Um, they tell me that all the floods in California happen between Christmas and New Year's. Um, I think they're out to get the Murphy's Law or something. But you see now that all of the streams are responding. Onion Creek is responding less dramatically than the other ones. Again, the only one of these gauges that is actually giving us discharge is the USGS gauge. The rest are really giving us a relative order of magnitude and timing to understand processes. All right, so the first thing that matters is where is it rain and where is it snow? The next thing that matters is here are my raindrops growing exponentially. Um, 
it's how hard is it raining? I am fundamentally a snow scientist, and I would like to tell you that snow is the most important thing on a rain on snow flood, but all of my research has showed that is not the case. So let's look at rain. So it turns out that when you have a storm coming in, now here, we're, we're backing up, here's Lake Tahoe, um, right up here, and this is the American River Basin I've been showing you. Down here is um, Yosemite near Mono Lake. And um, turns out that storms in California, um, there's a lot of ways the air can go. Um, from a hydrologist, we're so used to thinking about the terrain controlling everything. The terrain also controls the air masses, but the air has a lot more flexibility because it can go up higher in the air. So here's the storm coming in, and it turns out that when some air hits the Sierra Nevada, it turns. It basically slows down, which weakens the velocity, weakens the Coriolis force, and the pressure gradient turns that air to the left. This flows, rather than flowing over the Sierra Nevada, this flows parallel to it, and we have what's called the Sierra Nevada barrier jet. Um, this barrier jet creates an additional mass of air that the, that the airflow that's carrying our precipitating clouds has to push up and over as it goes over the mountain basin. And it turns out that the height of this mountain par parallel Sierra barrier jet changes our orographic precipitation patterns. So it actually changes how much and how hard it is raining at higher elevations. So um, this is a graph from a paper from 2010 that shows that if we look here on the left, this is a, you know, I plotted over a lot of storms, so it's a multiple of valley precipitation. So one is one times valley precipitation, and this is how much it's enhanced as we go up with elevation. Um, the over all days with precipitation, the red dashed line are the mean values you would get from PRISM for this area, and the observations match very well. However, during days with a low altitude barrier jet, when you have a um, less than 400 meter high um, a bunch of air moving parallel to the mountain instead of over it, the um, higher elevations actually get much more precipitation than you would expect from climatology, as much as twice as much. So right here, this would tell you you're getting, you know, three times the valley, you know, one is two, three times, you get four to five times the valley precipitation. So during these storms, there's been a lot of talk in California that we get cases where the snow must be melting more than the measurements say because we're getting more water out the bottom. Um, where these observations would suggest that it's actually raining harder at higher elevations than you would expect, and that's why we're getting more water out of the bottom. So as a sensitivity study, this is an incredibly simple hydrologic model wherein I've distributed precipitation with elevation in the blue line according to PRISM, so that's climate climatology. The black dashed line is, as I just showed you, for a low elevation Sierra barrier jet, you get more precipitation at higher elevations. And then the um, purple line is where I'm changing it based on measurements from a radar of how high is the Sierra barrier jet through time. Um, I didn't have time to show you, but a high altitude Sierra barrier jet actually has less precipitation at higher elevation than you would think. So in this, what the take home message is, is again, this is the Yuba Basin, which is right next to the North Fork of the American Basin. And when does this really matter? Turns out that this really matters during those big storm events. That if you put in climatology, you would get this blue line. If you put in a low altitude Sierra barrier jet, you would get this um, black line. So that more precipitation during an event when it is raining all the way up to the summit really makes a big difference in the stream flow you would expect. Um, by the same token, over the course of an entire year, if you got all of one type or all of the other, it would make a difference. But if you change it based on all the different Sierra barrier jets over a year, actually your stream flow in the spring is pretty close. So that was less important than I might have thought. All right, so we're looking at all of this different data. We're trying to figure out how do we get these rain on snow floods? How do we get the um, stream flow? And this, again, is the North Fork American River Basin, which is the site of the NOAA hydrometeorologic test bed, where they put out lots and lots and lots of measurements. Um, and so Nick Wayand headed up a paper that's currently in press where he's really trying to, I call it the driving data cook-off almost, um, 
we're trying to figure out what, what do you use? What, what should you put into your hydrologic model to get the best stream flow out? And what parts matter the most? Um, so he compared input data from all of the stations. And here you can see um, all of the different colors. The um, pink ones are put out by the NOAA, the hydrometeorological test bed. The green ones are put out by California Department of Water Resources. The blue ones, these are I buttons. Those are the cheap temperature sensors I showed you. And the triangle is where we have the USGS gauge. And then we have you know, my small basins with just stage measurements. And we also said, all right, let's look at a mesoscale atmospheric model. We can never measure everything everywhere. So how well do we model it? We're using WARF. And this is a very high resolution version of WARF run by Mimi Hughes um, in NOAA in Boulder. And we have output from WARF at each one of these black dots. So, OK, who's going to win the cook-off contest? The interesting thing is that, again, in the mean, everything looks good. Over one year, um, both PRISM and WARF matched the observations reasonably, um, both in terms of precipitation and temperature. Sadly, that, that isn't enough. Um, as discussed, these individual winter rain events are often missed um, due either to storm track, as WARF sometimes put the rain in the wrong basin, um, due to biases in the gauges, changes in that precipitation gradient that I showed you associated with the barrier jet. And so we're, we're still struggling there. Um, also, you'll note with cumulative stream flow, in this case, WARF over-predicted and PRISM under-predicted, the blue line is showing you with observations. In other years, the case was the opposite. There was no clear winner in terms of one giving you consistently better in an individual case or year. Also, you'll note here that the late season, um, snowmelt season, was quite difficult. And so I'm going to transition into what is going on there. So when we start getting into the late season, this is when heterogeneity of how snow is distributed starts becoming really important to late season flow. We also bring in another tool here is that once you start getting to late season snow, your snow starts disappearing. And so you can start using the visual imagery of snow disappearance dates from MODIS as well as some new sensor technology to figure out when that's disappearing. Also, snow melt rates become important. And again, we can use stream flow. So here, again, to zoom in, this is another year, 2008 to zoom into this late season stream flow period. And I'm, the two lines here, this is again from Nick's paper, um, are two WARF simulations where we thought that the difference was long wave radiation. And it turns out it, that actually didn't make that big a difference. Um, but you can see that you know, WARF is getting the precipitation about right in this year. Um, but in this case, we were able to use the small stage recorders. So here's the East Fork is our lower elevation one and Onion Creek is a higher elevation one, to trace which area of the basin we were having problems in. It turns out that actually, you know, this is for the entire river basin. You know, we have too much late season stream flow in our model. And this is actually, we're doing pretty well matching the timing in this East Fork Middle Basin. But a real problem is this high elevation Onion Creek Basin, where our observations show much more melt earlier in the spring and less snow left later in the spring, whereas wharf is melting too slow up there. And here's this is a picture of one of these beautiful concrete uh, anchors in the stream. So let's think a little bit more about late season stream flow. Um, in most hydrologic studies, these low flows get lost in the averages. You can say your root mean squared error, your Nash set cliff is very, very good as long as you've got large flows, whereas your low flows may be quite a bit off. If you look at a lot of papers, you'll see that these flows do not look very convincing. However, they are the most crucial to ecosystems, to hydropower, to agriculture, to our society. And part of the reason they are hardest to model correctly is, as I've mentioned before, they require a knowledge of snow variability. So why is that? Let's look at a little cartoon here. Um, it's um, based off of some work I actually did in my dissertation um, where I'm showing you on the left here some small streams, about 10 kilometers squared high up in the Tuolumne River watershed, and a larger stream. This is the Tuolumne River at Hetch Hetchy. And um, I start with a simple snowmelt model um, where I just increase snow depth with elevation. Um, each elevation band has 
a constant snow depth over that elevation band. And you can see our highest stream actually fits in one elevation band. And what you see um, in terms of the model is the, red, is the blue and the observed is the red is that the, in both the small basin and large basin, really the snow melts too early. So if we do nothing else, we keep the same mean amount of snow, we keep the same melt rates, all we do is we now say at each elevation, um, and this is just kind of a cartooning graphic to say now it's, it's a distribution. Instead of just one snow depth at that elevation, we have a range of snow depths at that elevation. Um, and actually, it just statistically made a range of melt rates. So snow is patchy, and it melts at different rates. We all, everyone who's gone out and played in the mountains knows that, right? The snow is highly variable. And if you do nothing else but model with heterogeneity, so you get this black line, all of a sudden, the stream flow is much better represented. The, um, you get a lot more late season snow. Um, there's a very nice review paper by Martin Clark that came out in 2011, which explains why this is the case and goes through all the various studies many people have done on this topic. So why exactly does heterogeneity work? Um, what's really happening is that to recreate the observations, we need less melt at the peak and more snow left late in the season. So if I just distribute the same amount of snow differently with the understanding melt outflow, so first order is melt rate times snow covered area. I can distribute my snow uniformly with depth D, or I can distribute it with, you know, half the area has one half the depth, and the other half the area has one and a half times the depth. All right, now we start melting it, and half the snow melts. Um, now we still have the whole area melting, so we have higher peak SWE, um, whereas in this case we now have only half the area contributing, so we have a lower peak, but now we go later into the season, the snow is all gone, and our little snow pile still has snow left in the season. So when we start getting late in the season, we start getting the advantage that MODIS can see the snow, yay, and track when it disappears. Um, so this is a most recent cloud-free image I could find March 4th. It turned out California is much less cloudy than um, Seattle, but they actually did get clouds the last couple of days. Again, here are my favorite places. You can orient the American River Basin by Lake Tahoe, and Yosemite is right next to Mona Lake. That's the Tuolumne River Basin. And so um, if we're having problems with late season, we need to update that spatially heterogeneous snow. It seems that our obvious choice to turn to would be MODIS. Um, but how well can MODIS really see? Um, this is where in these, um, this is another pile of junk, becomes useful, all these small temperature sensors um, Mark Rowley put out in, again, yeah, you can see my favorite basins. There's the American and the Tuolumne, where they are in California. For two water years, he put out arrays of these sensors to look at snow disappearance as observed by MODIS. Um, now, what you see over here on the right are the two water years. 2010 was about average. The dots here are the average snow course, snow water equivalent. And then this is what was measured for that year. You can see that in 2011 was a big year. We, we did not get a really dry year, but we did get two different years. Here's where he put them out. So here is Mark working very hard. He has just buried a small temperature sensor, the same ones we were putting in the air, but now we are putting them in the ground. Um, if you do put them in the ground, you have to make sure to protect them from corrosion. Um, ask me if you want more on that. But once you put it in the ground, um, Turns out as soon as the snow falls, snow is a wonderful insulator, and so you no longer get those diurnal temperature fluctuations. You get a nice flat line. In the Sierra Nevada, it flatlines right at zero because the snow is actually close to melting. We don't have um, permafrost in these locations. And so here you can see when snow is detected. So if you put out arrays of hundreds of these temperature sensors over an entire MODIS grid cell, you can actually start measuring things that are directly comparable to a satellite footprint. Instead of just you know one spot at a snow tail station, you can start looking at network of spots. And Mark put these across um, a gradient of forest canopy density from Tuolumne Meadows and Dana Meadows um, in Yosemite National Park to Onion Creek in the American River Basin to a forest dynamic plot, um, which is 79% forest cover is at lower elevation in Yosemite. And so here is a picture of Mark. He looks very sage here, so we can ask him questions and say, Mark, how well does MODIS see? And he'll tell you um, in, in the paper, which just came out um, in remote sensing of the environment, that MODIS works 
really well if there are no trees, or even if there are some trees, actually 23 to 32% trees. MODIS works excellent unless it happens to be cloudy, which we probably already knew, um, that MODIS can't see the snow under the clouds. Um, if you get up to Onion Creek 65%, MODIS was still not too bad, but it missed some late lying snow that was hiding under the trees. However, when we got to a really dense forest, which is most of the Pacific Northwest looks more like this, really MODIS did not do so well, clouds or otherwise. It was just too dense a forest for MODIS to see. Um, you might say, well, no, duh, we know we can't see through trees. But um, this was really nice to quantify that I was actually skeptical it could do anything. And it works really wonderfully in a lot of areas where late line snow is, where we have no measurements, and where it is critical to get those measurements. So as my, I need to leave some time for questions before everyone gets done with their um, lunch break. Um, so here's how I've tried to summarize what we've been doing and what we're working on currently. Um, this in the middle is a picture of Tuolumne Meadows in Yosemite National Park. And those of you who know me know this is my favorite place. I grew up going there every summer. And while most people, I think, are motivated to save the world, I honestly am not that altruistic. I'm motivated to go hiking in Yosemite. Um, I would like to save the world, too, but I do want to hike. Um, and I love this area. So I've been trying to figure out ecosystem and water supply around this place that I know very well and is very close to my heart. And so we're working our way around trying to understand precipitation, rain versus snow and temperature. Melt rates, um, we're getting more into figuring out that a lot of the problems with what I was showing you with Nick's model late in the season, what has to do with model structure and the full energy balance that you, you actually cannot simplify it for that case looking at snow disappearance, and looking at stream flow and stage. And all of these are feeding back to what water is available for the ecosystem and what kind of supply is available for people. Um, I'm now going to clutter this up with pictures of all kinds of my favorite junk, right? Um, how do we get at measurements of all these different pieces? You know, I've showed you um, precipitation. There's still no cheap way of doing it. Um, we've used some ground-based radars. We've used you know, our precip gauges that unfortunately get very beat up in the snow environment. Um, NASA is now launching the Global Precipitation Measurement Satellite, which we're hoping will, you know, give us some more insight. Rain versus snow, we've also used radars, we've used weather balloons, and we found, again, these little temperature sensors and trees are remarkably useful. Um, melt rates, we're starting to look at, again, satellite measurements of radiation. Um, we've started saying, okay, if we need the full energy balance, we just can't use cheap instruments in some cases. So here I'm climbing a tower at Snow Quality Pass in Washington, um, where we're, we're trying to learn how to use the sonic anemometer to calculate flux, um, which is fun but a steep learning curve. We're also looking at model structure in conjunction with Martin Clark. Um, and Nick Wayand is now modeling all these different layers of the snowpack, which in this case look very pretty. And I won't go into more than that. Snow disappearance, this is, and the satellite looks the same all the time. But um, this is now MODIS. And snow disappearance we can get from these temperature sensors in the ground. We also are becoming huge fans of hunting cameras. Um, we haven't yet captured any animals on our hunting cameras, but we're capturing snow disappearing very well. And then finally, stream flow and stage recorders as we work this through the system. Um, what we're doing that's – what I'm hoping to do in sort of the future that's a little bit different is can we make these connections in different orders? Whoops. So – I'm not sure anyone believes me if it will work, but can, if precipitation is our hardest thing to measure, can we get precipitation from combined measurements of stream flow stage and temperature? Um, maybe there's some new ways to get at precipitation that will help us understand the processes. Um, maybe we can use snow disappearance as a combined measure of both precipitation and melt rates as a metric that can help us, I'm again forgetting which arrow, help us get at both of these. And, um, also, what happens of our ecosystem? Here I've got these little cartoon Christmas trees grew all over Tuolumne Meadows, which is actually what the park rangers fear most. Um, we no longer have our beautiful view of the trees encroach. But what does that do in terms of melt rates, energy balance, snow disappearance, and stream flow and stage if we have these changes on the ecosystem? So in conclusion of this whirlwind tour, um, much of the trouble with modeling in mountain hydrology and ecology um, can be traced to these variations in meteorological fields, which we understand in the mean, but not so much in the specific. And sensor technology is really exciting because 
it's becoming cheap enough that we can actually feel free to be creative and just scatter things everywhere to help us unravel these patterns that we might not otherwise understand. And in acknowledgments, I really want to acknowledge my um, mountain hydrology research group here at the University of Washington, some of which are kind enough to actually sit here with me and be my live studio audience. Um, and people who have funded me, the National Science Foundation, NOAA, and NASA, and a number of my collaborators. And um, this here is um, courtesy of my, my husband. I asked him if Pikachu is really a pika. And he's, my, my teenage nephew told me absolutely no, but he could be one for Halloween. So this is a pika dressed up for Halloween. Um, and I will end there. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, aside from not being able to see everyone's faces while you present, the added challenge or, or perhaps disappointment is that you don't get to hear everyone's applause at the end of the talk either. <laughs> uh, but I assure you there's a few hydrologists on a number of campuses who are all smiling and applauding right now. Thank you. So thank you for a, a great talk. So for those um, for those on the line, and it looks like we've got over 90 people called in for this, uh, wow. please do feel free to um, type your questions into the chat box. And so we'll give you just a moment to get those going. Um, and Jessica, I would just ask that you maybe try to address them in the in the order that they come in. Okay. I um, I see somebody's typing, so I'll see what it shows up. Yeah, and uh, I want to thank you for a, a great kickoff to our seminar series um, with the emphasis on you know, not only how do we collect data in the field, but what do we do with it, and so how our models and our methods have, have feedback. You know, a number of great demonstrations there for us, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cheap wind monitors. Um, you could take pictures of something that's deflecting. That's the uh, um, Connie Millar just asked if I had an idea for cheap wind monitors. I think if you use a cheap digital camera and something with a known strength that you could see how far it deflects and then take a picture of it, you'd have an idea. <laughs> I, I can't see people's faces to see if they understand the answer to my question. Maybe they have to like type happy faces into the yeah. Or, or confused faces. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, uh, I'll ask a question while we have a few come in from the audience here. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so Jessica, you told us about a lot of successes where you were able to use instruments in unique ways or, or make lots of measurements. Um, surely you haven't had a 100% batting average on this. What, what's gone wrong and how do you know, how, how do you try to troubleshoot that ahead of time? Oh, what goes wrong? I, I have a lot of stories of what can go wrong. Um, we had... We had um, trees burned down and the eye buttons melted. That was interesting. Um, we had some squirrels steal a bunch of eye buttons. Um, <laughs> they, they break. We generally probably lose about 20% of the temperature sensors we put out. The, the stream flow sensors, both concrete, I thought 50-pound concrete weight in a tiny mountain stream would be really great. Um, it turns out during high flow, those little streams pick that concrete up and move it. I had one sensor go over a waterfall, and I found it at the bottom of the waterfall, and it still worked. That, and maybe that was a success. Uh, it wasn't measuring what I wanted it to, but it was impressive. It lasted. Um, we, I mean, we have the one thing with measuring stage, if the river picks up your um, stage recorder and puts it somewhere else in the river, like on the bank, it doesn't record stage anymore. Um, you record atmospheric pressure for the rest of the year. We've done that a lot. Um, we've had cases where snow is over the sensor in the tree. We didn't want snow on it, so there's a lot of troubleshooting of what is this. Um, you need a lot of patient people looking at your data. If you're collecting cheap data, you have to be aware that sometimes your results are really cheap, too. But, but help. <laughs> no, that's, that's, I mean, that's all the, that stuff helps me learn. You know, I think it helps us all to say, you know, what are the things I need to be prepared for, losing 20% of my loggers, for example. Mm -hmm. um, well, I shouldn't uh, dominate the conversation here. So there's, I see a couple more uh, questions um, from uh, Kaye Brubaker and, and on down the list. Maybe you want to take a look at those, Jessica. All right. So Kai Brubaker wants to know if the sensors were reporting wirelessly and in real time. Um, we tried that for a number of years, and what we found – um, with, with just a couple sensors, we found that we were spending most of our field time trying to get the wireless to work and that it always failed as soon as, like, 
peak snow or peak rainfall event, or whenever we most wanted that real-time measurement, it failed exactly then. I guess it also answers Adam's question of what breaks. And so I have personally switched to not trying to do anything wirelessly because I found that twofold, number one, I'm generally not on top of things enough to process my data in real time anyway. Um, number two, the quality of the data when you're putting out something cheap that no one's used is, you know, suspicious. I wouldn't tell the uh, river forecasting center to use it. And, um, and yeah, so number three, that if we really are trying to understand the whole network, that we wouldn't get to it until next summer anyway. So it, to me, it was it's quite possible the technology exists, but I have not invested my time in it. Okay, if my streams were more accessible and I could make manual discharge measurements, would you be able to develop a rating curve for the pressure sensors to get volume and or discharge? Yes, and we did for Tuolumne Meadows. So actually, I think I put up another slide here. Um, this is Nicoletta Christia has been doing a lot of modeling for the Tuolumne River system. And we actually, right in this meadow, we have um, where four streams come in, we are using those cheap pressure sensors in those stilling tubes, which we're able to fix much better than the concrete anchors. And with a lot of summers and springs of weighting and measuring, we have developed rating curves, and we are using all of these as we would for USGS gauges. At that point, they no longer become cheap because manpower costs so much. Um, just to go develop those rating curves. And if you have any kind of dynamic environment, you need to update them all the time because your streams are changing. Um, then um, Gus Colley asked, have you noticed any problems using the stage measurements during high flows, such as flows overtopping the bank and not capturing the true flow? Yeah, my biggest problem was the whole sensor got moved outside of the bank. Um, in terms of a stage itself where you're not trying to get the rating curve, if the pressure sensor stays put and it goes over the bank, it's still going up. So if what you're really looking at is timing of is the stream water rising or falling, that is still holds. Um, in terms of developing a rating curve, you have to actually yeah, have your floodplain rating curve as well or just say, I don't know what the translation from stage to discharge is at that point. Um, Russ wanted to know, based on field experience with spatial distribution of snow, do you find a lot of interannual repeatability of the pattern? And down to what spatial scales do you think this repeatability is intact? Um, there have been a lot of really great papers, um, one by Matthew Sturm and Wagner. Wagner is the co-author, um, where they actually have a picture of the Holy Cross in Colorado. is a very great picture where they show, look, the Holy Cross is had snow late lying in the same spot of this mountain every year for 100 years. This is a spatial pattern that's very repeatable. I think um, to a first order, we can use that That great, that um, there is a lot of interannual repeatability of the pattern, particularly because snow accumulation is a result of a lot of storms. Um, again, when I talked about things working well in the mean, if, um, you know, if you have, you could have several different weather patterns and precipitation events, but in the mean they will add up that the topography is the one fixed thing that really is controlling that. And so where snow piles up with relation to the topography is very repeatable from one year to another. Um, then Scotty, I, pr I may pronounce your last name wrong, um, says, can you comment on the issue of cheap and many versus more expensive few in the context of longevity, five to 10 years, and data quality usability. It seems reliability is a key issue here, and where do we draw the line? Um, I think that's a very, very good question, and I think part of um, when I show you my little uh, how everything goes together, when I said I want the full energy balance, I want the full model structure, and you can see a picture of a tower that I put in the closest snow to my house so I can visit it most frequently. Um, that I, I think we absolutely need some of each. Um, I would not say let's throw out our good high quality weather stations for you know cheap temperature sensors we can put everywhere. By the same token, how do you know where to put that high quality station? And if you just go to you know this was yes the closest place to my house, it's not actually representative of the whole terrain. Um, this particular site in Snoqualmie Pass is subject to cold air intrusions from the Eastern Cascades. It is much colder than any other spot at that elevation, and so we actually have a funny case story of where people fit their lapse rate for Washington State to that location, and turned out it was wrong for the entire state. 
um, because, yeah, that one accessible high location is not representative. So I think we need to do both. Um, given the last question where we talked about repeatability of spatial patterns, the plus is that if you go to a new place and you measure even one year, you know, and, and definitely after two, you have an idea of which sites are representative and which sites are not. You would know after one winter that my site by Snoqualmie Pass is colder than anywhere else. It only takes one winter. And then you could say, okay, now this is how I'm going to interpret that long-term data. Um, and then in terms of, of trends, you also have some idea of what are the patterns of meteorology that are leading towards that site being different, um, which in this case, it's you know, cold air trapped on the eastern side of the Cascades. And then if I am using this one long-term site for my climate record, how are changes in the frequency of cold air being on the eastern side of the Cascades actually affecting what I might think is representative of the whole mountain range when it's not? So we have to – that's kind of why I drew the last slide of going around in circles and trying to connect the dots in as many ways as possible. Um, we have to keep doing both. And it looks like um, everybody else looks happy, so I think I maybe – Done with questions? <laughs> yeah, well, we're, we're just a couple minutes past three, Jessica, so we've kept you even longer than you are, had initially committed to. Um, so, again, I want to just thank you very much for uh, a great talk today and, and a really good start to our seminar series this spring. Um, and for those in the audience, if there was something in here that you didn't catch all of, um, this will be archived on uh, SciV, and so um, you can get a link to that through the Quasi site, um, and, and at the end of the semester when we get them all up, um, Kayla or myself will, will blast everybody on the mailing list um, so you know that they're archived already. Um, and then, Jessica, the final thing I'd ask is if you would just flip to the slide that had your references on it. Um, mm -hmm. that's captured in the SciV uh, transmission here before we, um, before we break. So that way we'll, we'll permanently archive that reference list. Um, right, there's actually two pages. So here's page one. Hey, should I wait or it's no, page two? Hit pause. What, you'll, you'll get hit pause? They'll hit pause when they watch it. If they all right, all right. So there are my, my references. Okay, well, well, thank you very much again, Jessica, and thanks to everyone for getting on the line today. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, for those out there, please uh, tune in again this time next week. Um, we've got Colin Bodie talking to us um, about another. Uh, field data collection and uh, modeling um, experiment, also also oriented towards the West Coast, I believe. Uh, so thank you very much, all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Adam. Great. Thanks, Jessica. This is Kayla. So have a um, have a great weekend, and everyone else, see you next week. And enjoy the snow. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye all. Bye bye.